Hello and welcome to the Nittany Dispatch. I am John Sauber, Penn State football beat reporter for the Senate Daily Times. She is Audrey Snyder of The Athletic. Uh, Audrey, we we are probably wanna, gonna want to get into this here pretty quickly uh, before we dive too deep into this probably arduous discussion uh, that I'm sure uh, you know a lot of Penn State fans are waiting for. Uh, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe uh, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was bad. Yeah. Uh, we are coming to you. This is Saturday night. We're recording this. I'm just going to get this out of the way right now. Cause I think Penn state fans need this right now. That sound you hear is yeah, me cracking a beer. I think you all probably need a few right. of those after this one. Yeah. Frankly, I'm, I'm drinking aqua you know, because I, I dehydrate <laughs> myself every game day. It's really bad. I know, but there is, there is water on deck over here. Penn state. I, John, I, this was a mess. Um, Ohio State gets the win, twenty to twelve. Yes, I was wrong. Um, I was fooled into thinking that this year would be different. I believed that this Penn State offense was not only going to be capable of putting up points, but also competent. Um, and that's not what we saw. I mean, this was heading into the stadium Saturday morning. There were so many different ways I thought this would go. We had touched last week. You said you thought it would be a low-scoring game. I did not expect that Penn State would have this many questions coming out of this game. And quite frankly, every single question I have is about the Nittany Lion offense. Yeah, I want to get something out of the way here pretty quickly because I don't want people to think we glossed over it. I think Penn State has the best defense in the country. Uh, They're awesome. They're incredible. They played an incredible game. We are not going to talk much about this defense. Like, it's just – it's – this is entirely, like you said, about the offense and about how, uh, and I tweeted it out near the end of the game, all they needed was uh, an average performance to win. And mm-hmm. instead, they put on an abysmal one. Uh, this was this was as bad as it gets. Um, and, and from the top down, uh, this, this, was, this was bad, right? Like Mike Yersich was bad. Drew Aller was bad. The offensive line had its fair share of struggles, too. The wide receivers were bad. Honestly, though, uh, I know I listed them in what may have seemed like a random order, but to me, this is this is on Yursich. Like this is ninety percent of the blame here goes to Mike Yursich. It was an absolute mess from the start. I am not like, you know, I am not an NFL scout. I'm not a general manager, but I like if I can't figure out what your game plan is early in the game or what the intention of your offense is, what you're mm-hmm. trying to accomplish it's not a good sign, right? Like it should be clear what you're going to try to do to win the game. And it, at no point was it clear what Penn state was uh, basically what the objective was offensively. Yeah. And you know, what, John, you just said that, and I'm just thinking in my head right now, right? James Franklin said on Tuesday, this offense was not going to be something that it hasn't been all season, right? They knew what their identity was. I, this was a mess. I mean, this was an all around complete dud from the Penn state offense. And the thing that I still am just befuddled by, I mean, Penn State was one of 16, one of 16 on third down conversions. And that one conversion did not come late into the game. Uh, there was a penalty there. Um, but I believe this is up while I was waking up, making my way down to the field. Um, that was the the conversion late. I mean, this was Drew Aller after the game was asked, you know, how, how did he think he performed? And he fighting back tears said, sucked like I sucked this was not great um kudos to Drew for coming out talking with us um I mean he is 19 years old and 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 this is one of the times where it would have been nice to get answers from the adults right like I always default to that yeah I don't think just nice either like it would have been responsible for the adults to be answering for this because yeah Drew is technically an adult he's 19 years old uh, the fact that he had to be the front person for this. Now, James took questions as he always does. Like James is the first mm-hmm. person we talk to. He is the front man of it all. To his credit, he always he speaks talks for about, game. about 10 minutes. Uh, um, yeah. you know, the, the thing like, that kind of got it, me with this was James Franklin did not want to talk big picture. He wanted to talk about right. this one game. Well, you know what? You're one and nine against Ohio State. So yes, we've got a lot of questions because then it comes to, oh, you know, right after UMass, you don't want to talk about it. This week, he was asked a bigger picture question about Ohio State, and he said, well, you know, it's, the game's not any bigger. It's just because it's the opponent this week. There are massive questions, concerns, 
you look at the record three and 16 against teams in the AP top 10. Um, this was not a great performance. And on top of that, John, this game was there for the taking. Like Ohio State left the door open. If you had an offense that could just even slightly move the ball, Penn State wins this game. And I think that's the thing that has to be so maddening and so frustrating for fans is, yes, like this Ohio State team, I'm very curious what happens with the AP poll on Sunday. Um, because I, based off of what we saw today, I mean, both of these teams – have some warts, have some serious flaws. But yeah, like this was a team in Ohio State that you had every opportunity to take this game over. The defense did everything it possibly could. I mean, Marvin Harrison was going to get his, and he did. Uh, he was targeted 16 times, 11 catches, 162 yards. He had a long of 35, and he had one touchdown. Massive numbers, right? Those are I, I wide receivers. I don't one say this numbers. like... But this is going to sound like hyperbolic. Reasonably, he could have gotten 25 targets. He was consistently open. Kyle McCord did not do a great job of finding him. Yeah, he found him, would you say it was 11 times? Legitimately could have been like a 17-catch game for Marvin Harrison. I could have, you know, counted on both hands like the number of times that I saw him wide open. And it wasn't like, oh, we have a weird perspective. We are above the field. It's essentially the all-22 view. And you can see what is opening up. And I vividly remember early in the game, uh, there was a, a clear out route. I think it was Ohio State's first drive. They basically cleared out the left side of the field of, of the formation. And McCord ends up throwing up a, a, a contested catch to Julian Fleming, who doesn't come down with it. Mm -hmm. I believe it was Fleming. And Harrison is running a, a, a drag underneath, and he's wide open. He walks into the end zone if if he throws him the ball. And he didn't, right? And, and Penn State kind of got bailed out from that standpoint. That's not Penn State's fault. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best college football player in the country. Like, that's – he should win the Heisman, right? Like, I, I know Caleb Williams will get buzz. Michael Penix, too, rightfully so. Yeah. But, like, Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best football player in college football right now. Um, but, no, you're right. This this game was there for the taking, and not just there for the taking. They should have won. Uh, they blew it, quite frankly. This was this was not like, you know, one maybe one bounce goes their way. They're a little unlucky. Um, they they blew this game. They absolutely should have won it. And, you know, I think – I think people are going to have to an have to answer questions about this, right? Because this is, I, I said it last year after the Michigan game and they went on to go 10 and two win 11 games because the Rose will win. Is this just who Penn State is now? Like, is this just a team that consistently wins 10 games and next year that's a playoff team, but like, is this just a 10 win team from here to the end of the time? Always going to be great, but not elite. I think so, John. I mean, and I say this because, I felt like it was now or never, right? Because we're always going to have the caveat next year of, well, it's an expanded playoff field, right? So there's always going to be that. And fans are going to say, well, yeah, that's great. You got the 12 team field. Maybe you host a playoff game, but you never got in when it was just the 14 field. And it speaks to where this program is. I mean, I think so much of this, it's the year round race. We hear, oh, they're making all these other great strides. Well, you know what? Today was the day when it matters most to get it done on the field. And if you take care of business on the field, all of these other things then fall into place a little bit easier. And Penn State just could not get that done. And you're right. I mean, Kyle McCord was not particularly sharp. We got the numbers in front of me. Uh, completions on 22 of 35 passes, 286 yards, one touchdown. He was sacked twice. But you flip over to the other side of this, John. Drew Aller, 18 of 42, 191 yards. One touchdown, which of course came within the last 30 seconds of the game to Caden Saunders, sacked four times. Um, yeah, neither quarterback turned the ball over, but it really didn't matter. I mean, I, I felt like, and this is what was so bizarre about this, for so much of this game, I felt like Penn State could have been trailing by three or by 33, and it wouldn't have made a difference because they just couldn't move the ball. I mean, I was absolutely just stunned by how inefficient the offense was. And, you know, I could understand it. The first few drives, you're trying to feel things out. It's a big road environment. That place was rocking. And I know fans hate the noon kickoffs, big noon, all of that. You had college game day set up in the end zone. Uh, big noon was also set up in the other corner of the end zone. Like this atmosphere was tremendous. Like we thought it would, like we've always come to expect here in Columbus. So I get that early on. You're trying to figure it out. 
But once Penn State started running the ball with authority with Nick Singleton, right? He rips off that 20-yard run, then rips off one for 16. Yes, the defense adjusted, but the rest of the way, Singleton became an afterthought, and some of that was the play calling. And I just, again, I, I don't know, back to like our overall talk at the beginning, like what were they trying to do? Because we knew this receiving core was not a strength. We knew that there were plenty of flaws. I think it's fair to and say it, it's just a weakness at this point. It's not that it's just not a strength. It's a major yeah. weakness of this team. Yeah, uh, and you, you, know, you say, had Harrison Wallace back. You were healthy, right? You you were apparently healthy, although Vengo Wane got the start, played from my understanding the entire game. Maybe there was something that came up late while I was walking down to the field. Um, J.B. Nelson was not listed on the availability report. So you were as healthy as possible. Like, you had everything lined up, and then you roll this dud out there. Yeah, uh, I, I think – so I, I actually uh, thought – after the first quarter, I was like, oh, wow, Mike Yurcich is doing really well with this, right? Like, this is kind of exactly the formula that, that they needed to win this game. They had, I think it was seven carries for 50 yards at that point. By the way, the rest of the game, and I know Sacks took away some of the yards, they had negative one rushing yards from quarters two through four. Completely unacceptable. Uh, but I thought after the first quarter, you know, Aller was three of nine at that point too. But honestly, those throws early on, I thought were on him. Like, he just missed some spots where he had guys open and, you know, he didn't, he didn't hit guys uh, while they were on the move. He didn't, you know, he missed Keandre Lambert Smith on what looked like a corner route on one where Lambert Smith looked a little frustrated afterward. Um, and I thought Yurcich was calling a good game through the first quarter. I caught some shit for that on Twitter. Uh, people didn't seem to agree with me. It did not uh, age well, John. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Like, and this is like games change, right? Like, you know, the, the, the evaluating aspect of this changes as the game planning and the, the play calling changes. And I thought quarters two through four, he was an abject disaster. Uh, it felt like Drew was not comfortable uh, back there when I thought the protection was – I know some people harped on it. I mean, I'll rewatch the game tonight and I'll get a better picture for this, but I did not think it was that bad. Um, you know, I, I know uh, Olu Fashion who got caught at the end of the game by JT Tumalau, you know, on mm -hmm. the, the crucial fourth down. But, like, I mean, that happens. That guy's that good. Uh, but I think for the most part, the offensive line was good. And Aller was – not comfortable because guys weren't getting open. They weren't creating separation. And Drew mentioned after the game that, that your made these calls for these deep shots, um, you know, and that there were opportunities and they just didn't execute on them. And maybe that's the case, right? Maybe we'll see that on the rewatch that guys were open downfield, but part of the reason that maybe he's not taking those shots and maybe he's not comfortable doing it is because he didn't do it for six games. And so you're dealing with not, maybe not a confidence issue, but a, no, the smart thing is to check it down. I'm, I'm supposed to check it down, right? Like that mentality. I'm not saying Drew did not say that to be clear. I'm saying that, but like, it's possible that the, the, not the muscle memory, but like the reflexive like reaction is, Oh yeah, he's kind of open. But if I check it down here, they'll be happy with it because I'm not turning the ball. Over, right. Like that's, you're kind of, neutering your offense in some sense and taking away that big play ability because you're not trusting your guy to make that play when he needs to do it most. And then you roll into Columbus and you try and make that the first real time that you do it. And it's not going to work, right? Like it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, I, I, I don't put a lot of people are going to blame Drew out. Like I said, for this, I think that's incorrect. I think the blame should not be apportioned to him. Yes. He missed throws. I actually thought he missed more throws early than late. I thought late it looked like guys were not getting open as much. Um, I've talked a lot about how good Yurcich is at play design. Uh, today was not that. Today was very much not that. I, I'm i just, and again, this is first blush. You and I haven't a chance to go back and watch this yet. Um, but live, I mean, there were a couple instances for sure where, again, because we're getting like the all-22 view from up in the press box where I'm saying, yeah, Drew could have ran the ball there or, wow, that guy looks open. But more often than not, John, there was no place to go. And I think – all off season, right? The thing we kept writing, talking about was the receiving core. And again, I was fooled. I would like this game. I was fooled many times because I thought Dante Cephas this off season was going, going to be a massive difference maker for this offense. That is not whoops. held true. Yeah. That one's massive on me whoops. I was, I'm massive still, whoops. Still, still believe in Cephas as a player, but it's, it's not happening this year. I don't think it's, so. it's not there. I mean, and I know he came off the field at one point um, after a, I believe it was after the flea flicker right along that sequence and James Franklin laid into him pretty good. Not sure what was, what all that was about. Um, but 
you do not have playmakers in that receiving core. I think Keandre Lambert Smith can be that guy and should be that guy, but we just didn't see enough of that Saturday. Um, Harrison Wallace, I recall a 12 yard completion quiet thereafter. Theo Johnson had had probably the biggest play of the game, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, and then the offense, it was 34 yards or something like that. 34 yards. The offense just, just stalls out. It's another Alex Falcons field goal. And like to Falcons credit, like hit them both, right? Like this is something early on this season. I was talking, writing a lot about, so were you like field goals? Is this going to cost them? No, special teams did not cost them the game. The Penn State offense was a massive, massive problem. And I think, too, John, like you just you go through and you look at this and you say, well, there's one guy who swung this entire game and it wasn't either quarterback. It was Marvin Harrison Jr., right? And like, yes, he is that good that he can take a game over and we saw him do it. Yes, Penn State's secondary is good, but like, there is not that difference maker on the Penn State offense right now. And I thought we were going to see Nick Singleton be that guy. I thought we were going to see Keandre Lambert Smith maybe be that guy, maybe the tight ends. Um, here's the thing that gets me, John. The thing that the third down numbers, like that is just absolutely insane. The trick plays, right? We saw Keandre this Lambert. Is, this Smith is my biggest twice. issue. This Is this your biggest issue? Because we, have, we haven't discussed this. Yes, because it's it's maddening. It makes no sense. So the the first one is actually not the first one. The first one was the the flea flicker that you mentioned, where uh, it, it feels like that is some play design where it feels like you're overthinking it, right? That yep. should be a simple reverse because if Keandre just hangs onto that ball instead of pitching it back to Drew Aller, he's running free down the opposite sideline for a touchdown, right? Like it feels like you're adding layers and like you're adding four layers, and it's like. A trick play does not need to be four layers deep. It's like two or three layers deep. It's perfectly fine. So, like, the fact that he pitched it back to, to Drew and obviously no one's open on the sideline because it looks like a normal pass play uh, is bad. The second one was the what looked like a pass from Keandre to, I think, I, I still am not certain who the intended target was. I think either Theo Johnson or Tyler Warren was like 12 yards down the field, mm-hmm. which does not feel like when you run those plays, you're usually running someone deep. It did not seem like that was the case there, but they did it. Like, I really like the theory of what they're doing there, right? Like it's, you're taking it, you're trying to make a big play after you just got the ball back near the 50 yard line. That was, turnover. that was the, yes. The special teams comes up yes. huge momentum swing there, like massive momentum swing in this game. Cause at that point I thought, you know what? Ryan day goes for it on fourth down. Penn state defense gets a hell of a stop. And in my yes. head, I'm saying Ryan Day kick the field goal because seven points is massive because this offense can't score a touchdown, right? So like, well, that's the thing. That's head, the other thing, though. Like, do you really think they're going to drive 99 yards on you? <laughs> like, yeah, like, right. And, and, and like, no, you no, and like, there because I, you know they can't. I get that, right? So Day goes for the kill shot, doesn't happen. Um, but then you look at it and you're like, Penn State gets the ball back, and, and they're at they're at the 48, right? Uh, they're at their own 48, and it's just like. They couldn't do anything. I mean, it just felt like whenever they got the midfield, it was like, well, brace yourself because they're going to be punting soon. But, I mean, they just – Well, that's what – like It the, was the, crazy. Let's take a quick break from the podcast here to talk to you about our sponsor. That is the Voodoo Brewing Company in State College, the State College Pub. Of course, located at 201 Elmwood Street. Uh, a, Audrey and I at this point, I think, are considered frequenters of, of Voodoo. Uh, one of our favorite places to go. Uh, football season out of football season you really really can't beat it yeah awesome view awesome setup um the metmosa that is my go-to at voodoo brewery if you haven't gone there try it um it's exactly what you think it's not a mimosa it's a metmosa uh beer orange juice it's really good that's right um i just i love the setup there to me it's like a nice place to gather with some friends hang out and it's really nice all time of year john because like you get the the summer, great spot. Spring, we don't get many sunny days in State College, so when we have those, you got to enjoy them. Um, but with the fall, the weather getting bad, Voodoo will have fire pits soon, so you'll be able to enjoy the outside a little bit longer. Um, but check out our friends over at Voodoo Brewery. Yeah, and, and you know they, they have a new Voodoo kitchen there serving food as well. Tuesday nights at 6 p.m., they have their pub trivia. Thursday nights at 6 p.m., they have their bingo of which Audrey and I have been to as well. Uh, unsuccessful. Never won, but we've we've been yeah. several times. Never won. Frankly, that's on us. Poor bingo players. Uh, 
but no, just just a wonderful place to go, a wonderful place to have a beer. Again, that is Voodoo Brewing Company State College Pub, located at 201 Elmwood Street. Back to the pod. I like what, what I was saying earlier. I like trying to create a big play in that situation. Mm-hmm. If I'm trying to create a big play in that situation, I would like my five-star quarterback to throw the football. Mm-hmm. Why? Like Keandre Lambert Smith may be an excellent passer, right? Like he may be an excellent gadget play. Did it in high school? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, mm-hmm. like he did it. Did it in high school. Let your quarterback throw the ball. Send multiple guys deep and let him try and hit one of them it was so unnecessarily quote-unquote creative here right like there was there was no need to do that the goal yeah right the goal in that situation is to create it create a big play it is not to create a big play in the most uh weird play weird way possible right the second one the third trick play the second keandre lambert smith attempted pass was absolutely I mean, the game was pretty much over. They were always unlikely to recover the onside kick. By the way, going for two there is the right decision, just to outline the, the thinking behind it. It's an analytics play. I, I, I agree with it. Like The idea is you're down 14. If you go for two and get it, a touchdown wins you the game. If you don't get it, you can still go for two again and just tie the game. So essentially, you have two shots at going for two. If you get it on the first one, then you have a chance to win. If you get it on the second one, then you're still right where you were at the extra point. Um, I like. Do we think Penn State's best two-point play is Keandre Lambert Smith trying to throw a pass? Because if so, then like Help they've not. Got major problems. How like I, maybe maybe the idea there is like oh call something we've already called. We don't want to blow a two point play in a game that we're probably going to lose. Like maybe that's what they're thinking. I, otherwise, I don't know what is, they were thinking. Is, I, there were a I lot of uh, to be blunt, dumb play calls. That was the dumbest one of the night uh, or of the afternoon. Sorry, these mm-hmm. games are being at noon or still. The night uh, is young. Uh, yeah, a new thing. Uh, but like. It was it was the dumbest play call of the night. I couldn't believe that they did it. It was I tweeted something like that in one of the biggest moments of the game, they had their wide receiver throw a pass like for the second time. Just genuinely could not believe that it happened. I I just again like I, your offense has enough problems as it is, right? You're creating so extra we, problems. Yes, like why are we adding more layers of complexity to this, right? Like yeah, but hear me out, Audrey. Okay, so no one, can get open. no one can get open, right? One guy is pretty good at getting open. How about instead of giving let's him a chance him to get open, let's have him throw it? You know, I, right was, I was so close, John, a couple times. Um, so it, at the Ohio State Press Box, you have the, the visiting coaching box is down the hall from us. A couple times I was tempted to just go down there and be like, what's going on on the other side of the wall, the other side of the door, right? Like, I don't know. Maybe they're all too hopped up on Red Bull. I don't know. But like, there's so many ways you can slice and dice this game. And everything I keep coming back to is like, you had all the opportunities and your offense couldn't do anything. And to me, that's a, yes, your receiving core has massive issues. We knew this was a problem. It's going to be a problem. And you know what, John, like, Playing inferior opponents, it masks these issues, right? But they're still there. Um, I was thinking back, the Northwestern game, right? Early on in that game, we saw the problems with the offense, but it's like, oh, you know, it's the 11 a.m. start. It's Northwestern. They're on the road. But they got it together. They blew them out. Like, I was fooled by it. I picked them to win. I was completely wrong. Um, But also, like, I did not think they would struggle this much. And, like, the, the running the hex, I mean, it was very much a two series rotation, right? Like to me, yeah. this feels like we're trying to get both guys involved. We want to get both guys happy. And eh, yeah, Nick Singleton, you, you have rip off a few good runs. You look good. And then yeah, go over there on the sideline for a while because it's Katron's turn. Well, and, like, then, and then it leads to a situation where like they run that swing pass. I actually think it might have been just before the, the punt. So it ended up working out for them. The, the, which uh, punt, punt John? There were like a hundred of them. Which yeah. one? Well, the, the one that hit Lorenzo Styles. Uh, oh yeah, on, the game changing uh, punt. Yeah, yeah, Could the game changing yeah. punt. Mm-hmm. But the I believe they threw a swing pass to Singleton on that, and it's like because you're rotating guys, you don't have your best receiving back out there. Like Katron Allen should be out there in that situation. He's a better receiving back. Nick Singleton's really good in every pass catching, pass blocking situation. Katron Allen should be out there. He's just better at it. Stone Cold better at it at this point. There's no way around it. Uh, so, like, doing that kind of rotation leads to stuff like that happening where in the biggest game of the James Franklin era, 
you don't have your best options out on the field because you're rotating guys. And uh, I, I just don't get it. And I hate that we're like not even talking about the defense because they are that good. But like, it really is this bad offensively that you have to wonder what is going to change for this to get better. Uh, because Drew Aller is and deserves to be the quarterback this year and next year. He is, I'm still like uber confident in him as a passer. Um, frankly, as a runner too, like you said, like, there were a couple of times I thought he should have taken off when he would have had an opportunity to. Um, I'm still confident in the offensive line being good. Uh, I'm not confident in the receivers, but that's not going to change. Uh, they definitely have to hit the portal this off season. Like that has to be priority one, two, and three is getting receiving help. The running backs are really good. It's like this, this just kind of falls to the guy in charge of all of this, right? The guy calling plays in this situation, that's Mike Yurisich. And I I don't know how and, and by the way, if if you're a Penn State fan listening to this and you're pissed off right now, I think you have every right to be. Like they they have every opportunity to win a game that you and I both said going in that they're better than Ohio State, right? Genuinely still believe that to be true. Like from a, a you know position by position perspective, I think they're better. The difference is you mentioned Marvin Harrison Jr. I think Cade Stover is a little bit into that category too. They have two guys that can go out and win you a game on offense. Penn State's got a bunch of those dudes on defense. Across the board, they've got those dudes on defense. They don't have a single one at a skill position other than theoretically Aller, and he's not there yet. They it don't doesn't have a matter single if he's ever going to throw right to, now. right? Like, right. Like, he can be as good as he wants. If guys aren't getting open, if guys aren't catching passes, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. And, again, I don't, I'm not absolving him in this situation. He was not good. He was he, – this was – Easily the worst game of his career. Uh, he he was inaccurate early. Um, I thought he played a little skittish late. But I don't – the early stuff is definitely on him. I don't know that I can put the late stuff on him because he was kind of set up to fail. Yeah, I, I mean, I think – and you hit on Cade Stover and James Franklin was very complimentary of him throughout yeah. the week. And well, he, had as the, he had that one catch up the seam that I was like, it was over Kobe King and Kobe King, like, yep. he was there. He was right there. He was just, if, yeah. he was, if he was a little bit taller, or a little bit longer arms, he would have tipped it. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, I couldn't believe Stover got it. I mean, Stover, remarkable. And I, th- I think Penn State has some big time players at tight end and we're just not yes. seeing it. And it's like, you have the big play to Theo Johnson and then you just kind of forget about it. Right. And like, to me, the moment when I was like, this thing is absolutely dead, cooked, like I'm sending in the story now type of deal um, was after the, the fumble recovery, right? Ball hits yep. off the Ohio State player. Penn State recovers it. Tyler Ells did massive momentum swing. And I said, all right, you just got to move the ball a little bit, right? Like you just got to, you got a half a field to work with. And then Penn State ends up punting the ball from the exact same spot where they took over, right? Because you, had, you yeah. had a sack in there, and you're faced with third and 15. And I'm like, third and 15 at this point for, for an offense that hadn't converted a third just down all day, do like, might as well been, like, third and a mile. I mean, it just was – it was that bad. And I believe they went to one of the tight ends. It might have been Theo Johnson. Got maybe five yards. And then you punt again. I mean, like, when Penn State went into the transfer portal this offseason looking for difference makers, little did they know, John – when it came time for the Ohio State game, they're going to be relying on Riley Thompson left and right. Forget yeah. about the receivers. Forget about anybody else. Uh, you had to go and get a punter, and and this was your showcase for your punter. Like what a what a mess. And and I think too, right? Like I'm curious, by the way, before we yeah, because I, I we probably have to talk about the receivers specifically a little, a little more. I know you have the game notes in front of you. Don't look at them. Do you know how many targets Keandre Lambert Smith had? No, we had a few pass attempts. Um, I would say probably like six or seven. Twelve. I do <sighs> not remember half of them. So what I said, do you know how many Theo Johnson had or how many he's credited for? Not enough. Probably like four or five. Eight. I don't remember it. Right? Like these guys, because and part of the reason you don't remember these things is because they weren't open or they weren't put in a position to succeed. They didn't have a real chance to make a play on the ball. Uh, because they couldn't get separation, because they weren't schemed open, because they weren't given an advantage by the guy who's supposed to be in charge of giving them advantages across the field. Um, yeah, 20 targets between those two, and they finished with eight catches for 91 yards. Like, that's not good enough. And I'm not blaming them, to be clear. I don't think it's either of their fault. I don't, like I said, I don't think it's Alice's fault. I think it's just 
you know, Al was put in situations where he's tried to make tight window throws or windows that don't exist. And those guys are trying to make catches that aren't easy or aren't kind of available to them. Uh, and, you know, they're they're kind of destined to fail. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think they have the, the guys, they have talent to, to do that with. And I think the best um, coordinators in the country take the talent they have and they maximize it, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think if Marvin Harrison Jr. is on Penn State, that they win this game. But I wonder if he's used as effectively, right? And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, well, here's the flip side yeah, of that, John. I, if you're Drew Aller and you're suiting up for Ohio State, how good are the Buckeyes then, right? Like, I still I think, think they, I think they blow out of the water. The more, I think he's the more gifted quarterback, right? And that's like a crazy what if, right? And then one of the other things that also came up during the game, if Julian Fleming was suiting up for Penn State, he definitely would have been their number one receiver. Um, so, so you have, again, the recruiting trail, the 365-day-a-year race here. But the bottom line is Penn State isn't good enough. And the the, the fact of the matter is, Five years after James Franklin's great, not yet elite comment, the results haven't changed, right? And to me, this is where this program has to take a serious, long and hard look at everything, right? Like losses like this, Ohio State, Michigan, everything has to be under the microscope. Um, because well, quite by the frankly, way, he, he admitted that it's not good enough earlier this week and like it kind of got glossed over. I don't mm-hmm. remember if we talked about it on the pod. It, it was, it was, said- was it the identity comment? Is that, is that what you're referring well, he, to? No, he said he said that they uh, have done a good job closing the gap on the top five teams in the country. Oh, after and like kind of refer to themselves yeah. as like the top the top ten program. Like that's mm-hmm. an admission that you're behind still, uh, which is really interesting. But he did say it would be a one position I mean, right. game, and it technically yeah. was at the end. Te- although technically was by the end one of one position, you could have told me they were down by fifty, and it would not have mattered at that point. Like it just. It just was such, it was so crazy in so many ways. And I think it's like, how do you, how do you rectify this moving forward? What do you do? Like you went out, this is what is fifth OC. Yeah. I'm like, right. You beat Indiana. You should beat, you should beat Indiana, right? Like Penn state has done a great job under James Franklin for the most part of beating the teams that they should beat. But you know what? That's not why you're paid $10 million a year, right? Like, this is not why we hear so much about facilities. This is not why we hear so much about, hey, if Ryan Day needs $13 million for NIL to keep his roster, we need the same or more, right? Like, this, Jim Knowles took Mike Yurcich's lunch money and then some, right? Like, this is the the coordinator that you wanted. He he went up to him. Pre-game, uh, Knowles went up to yours yes. and was gave him a hug, and they were talking. You know, they, they coached together on the Oklahoma State coaching staff in 2018. They both should have been abundantly familiar with each other, but it sure seemed like the one guy was more familiar with the other, right? Like it seemed like Knowles had an yeah. advantage every step of the way. And listen, like to be clear, Ohio State's defense is one of the five best in the country. Mm-hmm. I genuinely Great. think there's an argument that four of the five best defenses are in the Big Ten: in Iowa, Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State. Like I think that is absolutely on the table. I don't. I mean, I haven't. Don't know the numbers. I'm not saying that definitively, but it is absolutely possible. Um, this Ohio State defense is absolutely elite. Penn State did not have to come out and light it up for 35. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think that's the benchmark here, right? Like, no one's saying that they should have been throwing the ball all over the yard. They should have been dominating from the start. They should have scored 35. They should have been able to score, I don't know, two touchdowns, right? Like, I don't think that's too much to ask when your defense is consistently giving you the ball back like Ohio State's defense was doing for it, but it, its offense took advantage because it was good enough. Like, I, outside of Harrison, outside of Stover, of the healthy guys today, to be clear, because yeah. Igmeka Buka is fantastic. Yep. Same with Trevion Henderson is fantastic as well. Of the guys that played today, they were good enough, right? Like, it's Harrison, Stover. This was a much else. more banged-up Ohio State roster than Penn State. Like, yes. Penn State was – you had health in your favor as well, which is luck, right, for the most part. And, yes, yes. Chop Robinson got hurt in this game, um, looked pretty significant. Yeah, that um, was a scary was injury. Scary. And, and, but and there was no James update Franklin. afterward. James Franklin was not yeah. asked about it. It was a pretty short news conference. Um, I did ask Adiza Isaac about it, and he said he was able to talk to Chop at halftime. Um, but, again, I mean, towel draped over the head, took a long time to get off the field, certainly yep. looked like he took a shot um, to the yeah. head. So yeah. we'll monitor that moving forward. But, like, that's not why you lost this game, right? People want to yeah. complain about the holding penalty on Kalen King. That is not why you lost this game. This is all By the way, on that, the I, 
yes. I and, and like here's the thing, like the the two touchdowns that the defense gives up, right? It's it's one touchdown right after that massive swing, right, where it looks like that mm-hmm. they're going to be up 10-3 because Curtis Jacobs makes a great play on the ball and and forces a fumble and takes it away back, comes out the penalty and comes back, and the defense like allows Ohio State to score after that because there's another penalty on King after that who did not have his best game today. Like I, I think yeah. that was abundantly clear. Um, but they they allow a touchdown there, which fine, like that's that's not a great result there, but it's one touchdown. Uh, the second touchdown was late in the game. It was maybe not decided, but kind of close to it at that point. And uh, Marvin Harrison caught a crossing route. It just was uh, more athletic than everybody else and faster and bigger and stronger. Hit another and, gear. <laughs> yeah, and just blew, blew past everyone. I was down on the field for that, and he was he was coming toward the sideline where I was standing. It's just it's one of those things you see him first, like, man, he can fly. Like, uh, he's incredible. But it was it was a play where it's like, you know, yes, they gave up a second touchdown. It's tough to fall to defense who's been on the field as much as they have uh, and been dealing with him all game. He's going to get his. Like, it is – it's not like even a situation where you can say, like, oh, the best defensive coordinators can can stop him. Like, the best defensive coordinators are hoping for, like, eight for 110 or eight for 90 yards and a touchdown for Marvin Harris. Like, that's best-case scenario. He, he could be a number one receiver on an NFL team right now, and he probably will be this time next year. Uh, the defense was like legitimately fantastic across the board. Mm-hmm. Fantastic outside of King struggling a little bit. Um, but again, he they caught Hardy, I, man. I think he had Dick three Hardy was awesome. in the first quarter, right? That's like another play, by the way, and... a special teams mistake by Daquan Hardy taking over yeah, the, the job full mm-hmm. time this week. Uh, cost Penn State about 25 yards. Um, lets a punt go by. Asked him about it after the game. Uh, I felt bad for him. Everyone seemed to be just stopping by, asking about that and leaving because we were all curious about it. But uh, he got asked about it a bunch and gave me the answer that essentially he thought he had tracked it well. And at the last second, like he thought it took like a weird spin and he kind of lost it. And uh, that was that. Um, yeah, it becomes a 72 yard punt <laughs> because of the bounce, right? And yeah. Like, like it, it, what should have been Penn State getting the ball at the 50, which, uh, by the way, as we found out after the. Uh, punt that Tyler Elson recovered that was I think technically mm-hmm. it's, it's considered a moth. Uh they is not a guarantee they would score uh because they might have messed that up and the offense was so uh incompetent today that I, I don't know that getting the ball to fifty changes anything. Um yeah this was this was bad. This was as bad of an outcome as you could reasonably this expect was... I think for Penn State because yeah. it sets the tone that not only are they not there right now, there's no discernible path to get there unless major changes are made. Yeah, I, I think this offense, and again, this is all the offense. Like you are, it feels like right now, and I think we might have, I feel like we talked about this at some point, whether it was on the podcast or may, maybe in our car rides together, John. I think at some point, one of us made the point where we're like, you know what? You don't want to piss away an opportunity with an elite defense because your offense is yes. together. And that's what it felt like today was um, it, you have this defense that can win you so many games. Right. And like, I'm not asking for a top five defense. I don't think Penn or top five offense. I don't think Penn state fans are asking for a top 10 offense, right? Like you just needed an okay offense today and you couldn't even get that. And then I think, you know, you say, James, we've seen so many coordinators come through here, right? You made you got rid of Taylor Stubblefield in the in the off season, right? Because you you said your presumably your wide receiver recruiting wasn't good enough, right? So you bring in Haggins, and, and now we're still talking about the wide receivers after your biggest game thus far. Uh, that's that's a problem. Like I don't I don't think you can look at everything that happened with this offense and say like, yeah, it's just gonna go away, right? It was fluky plays. Like they didn't even turn the ball over. Like that's the other crazy part. Like. You played turnover-free right. football, and it was still this bad as an offense. Well, like, they, I they just, may as well have been turning it over with all the three and outs. The, like, those yeah, may as well I, be turnovers. I mean, no, and, like, you can't get into any rhythm, and, right, we always hear about that with play call. You want to get in the flow of the game, get in the rhythm, and, like, you're three and out, three and out, three and out. Like, you just can't do that. I, I don't – I come out of this game with so many more questions about the offense than I – anticipated ever having coming into this. And then I add on to that. I say, well, is anything going to be any better against Michigan next month? Right? Like, cause again, that's what you're graded on. Like it, it the, the 10 and two, like 
it's same old, same old. And like, yes, so many teams would love to be 10 and two and like be proud of that. But again, like this was about like this whole year and next year, it's supposed to be about being so much more than that, right? Like you were built for this year, you were built for 2024. And now I don't, I don't know. Like, I just don't know what you can do with this offense. And it, the lights certainly looked too bright for Mike Yersich tonight. They looked too yeah. bright for Drew Aller. Uh, they looked too bright for, for so they, many of these guys. And what what is endlessly frustrating to me, and this is, again, a journalist complaint. Like, and there weren't even lights on because it was a noon game. <laughs> right. The lights were not too bright for Drew, though, when he spoke afterward um, because mm-hmm. he was forced to be the one to take accountability for the offense. Him and Theo Johnson and Caden Saunders and – you know, it's the same passionate. thing that happened after fourth and five, where they bring out Trace McSorley. We don't hear from Ricky Ronnie till weeks later. Like, yep, I don't. We don't uh, know when we're going to talk to Mike Yurcich again. We don't know when he's going to mm-hmm. be available. Well, I can um, tell. You, I can guarantee you what the what the response is going to be. It's going to be, well, I'm here to talk about this specific game because that's how it always goes, right. and that's the thing that's so frustrating. As there's a lack of accountability, quite frankly, from it, yeah, and and fans have questions, right? We have questions too as reporters. We're working. We're trying to get you guys the answers, um, and that's what, what's so maddening because you know James Franklin wants to be, and I get it. This is so many programs. They want to be that singular voice, like the the head coach, the spokesman. They want to deliver the messaging, but there are so many questions. And the thing that I asked James Franklin after this was, back in the first quarter, Penn State had third and one, right? And I'm thinking third and one, run the ball. We see Aller attempt a pass to Keandre Lambert-Smith, incomplete. Penn State then takes a timeout. They come out of the timeout and decide to punt. So you just burn that, the time. That to me, like this is and James Allen talks about like out of that. Cause that was my question to James Franklin. Like the drew audible yes. out of that. Why you threw the ball? No, James Franklin said the play call was a pass on third and one. So like, this is supposed to be a great offensive line. This is supposed to be two of the best backs in the country. And yes. that's do like, I just, you're not playing to your strengths. And like, it's just, it's so baffling to watch. This is this drove me nuts, and this like mm-hmm. I get annoyed with this idea that like oh people only complain, and like maybe some people will do this. I like to think I'm not one of them. James will always tell us like oh if the result is bad, then it's a bad decision. If the result's good, everyone says it's a good decision. Mm-hmm. I try really hard not to think that way, and like that's why in those situations you'll see me like in a game like I'll tweet like oh I like this decision to go for it before the result right before you see what happens because I want it to be known that I think this is good regardless of what happens here I think they're making the right decision and that's what I I tweeted out and when it got to fourth and one is like I think this is the right decision here to go for it I would have run it the play before though if you're on third and one run it twice third and one fourth and one especially the six five 240 pound quarterback sneak it sneak the ball but like this is just push baby right like yes this I, is where I we first saw the T formation with Penn State a few years ago, too. And they, right. they did not and I, they did not throw it back to that today. I thought it was the right decision to potentially go for it on that fourth and one for them to call a timeout and come out and play to lose, because that's what that is. Not going yeah. for it there is playing to lose. Uh very passive. You need to trust your offensive line. You need to trust your quarterback. You need to trust your running backs. How many times this game were they in like third and six? It felt like a hundred. I'm sure it was like four, maybe three. Were they in like third and six and would run it with Nick Singleton and what looked like an attempt to like pick up half the yardage and then go for it and then just get stuffed on a one yard loss and then have to punt, right? Like, yeah, you need to, if like those, this is this, it's tough with the, the process and everything of, of making these decisions. Generally, like if you're like third and six, uh, I, I am personally, I'm throwing the ball twice, there, right? Giving yourself two shots at picking up six yards because that I don't know the, the numbers on this, but like. To me, I think that's your best shot at getting a chunk play, essentially, which is what you're asking for there. But also, if you're John, in third and one or third and two, run court. it twice, right? But like, give give, like, give Theo Johnson a chance. Draw Side something ends, up. Yep. Again, this is who this is. I go back to who's mm-hmm. responsible for this. Draw something up. Have something designed there where you can trust that Theo Johnson is going to have a chance to operate in space, where Keandre Lambert Smith can operate in space where Dante Cephas can get open, where Harrison Wallace can, the third can get open. Like, give these guys an opportunity to do something. Give Put them in a position to succeed, uh, unlike what we saw all night. Um, I just, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to believe that this went as as horrendously as it did. And, like, I, like I said, it's it's genuinely, like, not something I expected. Maybe I, 
I don't know. I feel a little bit dumb because I thought I didn't think that they were suddenly going to unveil a whole new offense for Ohio State. But I maybe you know deep down, like I was thinking, like oh yeah, they have to like this will this will be better. Like there's no way their offense is this hyper conservative or this like disjointed. And like I feel dumb, right? Like our job is to give that analysis and like and like had the wool pulled over eyes too, I guess, because I they, yeah. they just are that bad. And I think. The the other thing, too, is like, I, and I had to laugh about this after the game because somebody said this, I think, maybe before or while we were going to interview, something like that. They're like, well, I guess we can just figure out that, like, Penn State was not holding back the explosive element of this offense. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that's pretty clear. Like, it is, it is not there, and you knew it wasn't there. And I think it was a very telling comment at the time hindsight, extremely telling when we heard from Mike Yersich during the bye week about the receivers and drew being on the same page. And, and he said that it's not there yet, but they need to remedy it fast. Yeah, it, it's not. And will anything go better against Michigan? Right? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, cause it, it's tough to figure coming off of this and yes, you reserve the right to get better. Every team does. Um, uh, but you also have to make sure something like this doesn't snowball. And one of the things that players after the game said, and and I think some of this is probably just kind of status quo to some regard, um, but Theo Johnson said, he's like, yeah, the offensive players after this one, we weren't really talking to the defense. Because, like, again, what are you going to say, right? Like, I think that's the, the other side. And I was asking say. players. Yeah, like, my thing was, what did Mike Yersich say to you guys? Because he's not talking to us. So what did he say? And they said that, you know, Mike said, hey, like there have been a lot of good teams that have been 11 and one and have done really good things. And like, let's hold each other accountable and this and that um, you, there, there's going to have to be. And again, we heard so much about leadership this offseason. Well, that's where this is going to get tested this week. And Theo Johnson yep. absolutely is one of those guys, the leader. We always see him breaking down the team pregame. Um that's going to come into focus this week. And, and how do you kind of keep this thing on track? Because it's easy to point fingers after this one. And I think it's really easy to do if you're a defensive player after this to say like offense, like what, what was that? Right. Cause I think that's well, the, and, that's the natural reaction. To some guys credit post game, Curtis Jacobs, the guys I talked to, to be clear, when I say some guys, I'm not insinuating that others were casting blame. Curtis Jacobs mm-hmm. said, well, we didn't do well enough because we we didn't hold them to fewer points than than that, right? Like they they didn't do yeah. good enough job as as a defense. Uh, Adisa Isaac said, you know, we tried to do, to quote from him, try to do our best to have the offense and special teams back. Obviously, it's a team game; you can't do it alone. We fe- feel like we played a hard game against a great opponent. We just probably we didn't do enough on defense, right? Like this is those guys taking accountability to their credit. But to me, they're taking accountability for the failures of the offense. And that's not necessary. Yeah. And I don't think it's something that they should feel obligated to do. Um, I I don't know. Like, I, the idea, I think, was broached post game two with Drew that, like, you know, was there a need for him to step up as a leader? I don't think that's, I think that has nothing to do with this, right? Like, I think this team has plenty of leaders. Like you said, yeah. it's on them to step up now. Um, but I, I do the think performance like, has to be the, better. Like, that's the, yeah, it, that's the it thing. has nothing to do with. Yeah, it has nothing to do with any of that. I think maybe the idea of like coalescing, and I get what you're saying, like don't let one turn into two or what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they play Indiana next week. Indiana is really bad. And for as disjointed as it may feel, Penn State fans, it can always be worse. Uh, things are really bad with the Hoosiers <laughs> right now. I do not expect that team. They may not win another game the rest of the year. Certainly not next week. Um, but yeah, this was... I don't know. I think for Penn State fans, probably a, a nightmare scenario, right? Because it's not like you can leave this game feeling like optimistic, like, oh, it was mm-hmm. you know, they're right there. Like, they, you know, they, if just this had gone this way or what have you, it was, they were outclassed uh, on one side of the ball. Like, had no business being on the same field as Ohio State. And I'm thinking just off the top of my head, John, like the Ohio State losses under James Franklin, and like, where do you even slot this one in at, right? Because you have the two one-point losses in 17 and 18. You have the 14 game in double overtime. You Honestly, have one win to me, in 2016. Like, to me, this felt like more of a step back because Ohio State is not that world power. And like, we'll see where they are in the AP poll. But like, for anyone 
watching this kind of from like a national perspective, I think you're watching both of these teams and being like, whew, this is not, you know, yeah, two great defenses, but these yes. offenses are, are a work in progress to put it nicely, I think. And yeah, the thing so is for Ohio I, State, they have guys that can carry it still, though. Like, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. They can be good enough offensively against any team. And in the because of if that. you just end up looking at this on paper, right? You're going to say, oh, Penn State lost 20 to 12. Like, oh, it can't be that bad. No, you dig into the numbers. It was that bad, right? Like, I think like we'll probably hear nothing. that. Yeah, I, I mean, it just it just felt like because the offense was so bad. Like, God, did I, this is going to sound pretty mean, John, but I guess this is kind of what it's like to watch Iowa every week. I, yeah, listen, I made the joke to you that I was going <laughs> to compare this offense to a Ferentz offense, which I have ripped before. Mm-hmm. Because Brian Ferentz obviously has that job because he's Kirk Ferentz's son and uh, presumably will lose it at the end of the year because he does not meet the very, very easy goal. And not easy from like a me and you standpoint, easy yeah. goal in the world of college football as a Big Ten team of scoring 25 points per game when counting your defense's touchdown, which they score a lot of. Uh, you know, that is the worst offense in college football, the Iowa offense. And honestly, it felt a little bit like this game was taking place in Iowa City. Right. Like it did not feel like a Penn State offense. It felt like an aimless offense, the kind that I'm sure, unfortunately for Hawkeyes fans, that they've gotten used to watching. Uh, and I'm sure had they tuned in to big noon kickoff that they may have gotten confused and thought they were watching their own team. Yeah, I just pulled up the number in front of me from ESPN Stats and Info. Uh, Penn State one of 16 on third downs, 6.3%. Um, with a minimum of 15 third down attempts, that's the worst third down conversion percentage by any AP ranked team in a game over the last 10 seasons. So again, like this wasn't just like, oh, they look bad. Like this was historically epically bad on third down, your money down. Um, and yeah, I don't, I mean, there's, gosh, I don't be- even begin to know when you watch the film for from this one, right? If you're Mike Yersich, if you're this offense, like I'm sure as we record this Saturday night, they're already back in state college and probably diving into this one. You know, we'll hear, make the correction Sunday, flush it, move on. But like, there's well, a lot of flushing. Like I, I asked, I asked James post game, right? Like, how would you evaluate the offensive play call at this game? And he said, they, you know, they it was a one score game. They thought he thought they should run more, which I agree with. Like, again, I'm not, you know, over here waving the the run the ball banner or anything like that. But I thought today they definitely could have used a few more rushes. Um, But he also said they'll evaluate it on Sunday. And so on Tuesday, I'm sure, if not me, someone will ask, what was the evaluation of the offensive play calling? Where is that? Where do they need to improve? And we've moved Um, on to Indiana week. (laughs) Yeah. I I hope we get an answer. I was going to say, I hope we get an answer to that because like, I think fans. I think we will because it's a big enough moment. I I think we will. Um, Because again, there's, there's just so many questions. And I think to um, can, can we point to some positives today, John, what, do we have any positives from the entire game? No, I mean, yeah, the defense is so super... good. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know what? Like, you see, Chuck by the way, this is the thing. I don't not to. Moment. Yeah, not no, to. But, what but if they didn't the miss a beat. Like that's that's yeah. the thing. They didn't miss a beat. But not to what if the whole thing about the, the play with Curtis Jacobs, the strip sack and return. Don't do don't it, know. John. Don't, don't do know. it. I've I don't seen know if enough you of this on Twitter. I don't know if you noticed this. No, on on that play, uh, Curtis wasn't the first Penn State player to get to Kyle McCord. Deny gets there, beats his guy, and goes with the, the rip move to try to rip the ball out of, of Kyle McCord. And McCord doesn't have his arm back to throw or anything, so he kind of whiffs on it. McCord steps up into Jacobs. But if Dennis Sutton obviously gets his like hand on the ball there, it's out before the yeah. uh, holding call happens, definitively before the holding call happens. Uh, and then suddenly you're in the what if of like, do they recover? Does Ohio State still score? Like, are they rattled because they fumbled even if they if they recover? So to me, yeah. like, that's and uh, by the way, that I'm not like saying I did something wrong. He did the absolute right thing. He just got a little unlucky. Um, I thought he was fantastic. I thought Daquan Hardy outside of the punt issue was fantastic. I thought Johnny Dixon was absurd. Yeah, like he was really good. Marvin really Harrison really good. actually had a hard time with with Johnny Dixon when they were in man coverage on occasion. Now again, Marvin's going to win his because he's the best player mm-hmm. in college football, but. Uh, I thought the safeties were fantastic. To, to point out one play specifically that like evoked a, a real reaction for me in the press box when that we talk about the goal line stand that Penn State made. Yes. So in the fourth and goal situation, Ohio State rushes up to the line, clearly gets the look they want. Their trips to the right, 
they have essentially they're gonna they run a swing route that's actually a screen essentially uh because Kalen king was a little late getting out because he thought he was gonna be lined up on the other side of the scrimmage uh line of scrimmage mccord gets rid of the ball quickly throws it zaki wheatley and jalen reed absolutely blew that play up it never had a chance and like I made a noise in the press box because they made that play so quickly on a play that Ohio State had a definitive advantage. They got the exact look that they wanted to get to beat Penn State. And those two were so good and saw that play coming so well, they blew it up for a loss and got the team, the, got the offense, the ball back. We don't have to talk about, we've already spent, uh, what are we, 50 plus minutes talking about <laughs> what happened next. But like that play in and of itself, like that's, that's what this defense is, right? It's so swarming. Yeah. It's always around the ball. It's always attacking. It's always putting you on the back foot. Penn State's defense dictates the terms of action, right? Like they dictate the flow of the game and how it's going to go. They do such a good job of it. And uh, it's it's honestly a shame that they didn't get paid off for it today because that, that defense deserved to win. Also, John, I think uh, Brian Day, throw the ball in the end zone there, right? Like I think that's what I would have done. Um, the other I'm, thing, I, and, and I think, don't need it like with three well, timeouts. Like, this is where I, I'm going, John. The, it's clearly this like is a trust McCord. Think, yes, this is why it's it's so haunting for Penn State because of all the flaws, all the warts that we've rolled out here for the past 55 minutes. You then have the reality of I'm sitting there uh, before the half, and I'm saying, man, this is this is going to be a big momentum swing because Ohio State gets the ball to start the third quarter. 42 seconds left, three timeouts, they get the ball, and they decided to knee it out. And I'm like, Ryan Day, what are you doing? And I guess his reasoning afterward, I was talking to my colleague at The Athletic about it, and Cam said that like Ryan Day was like afraid they were going to turn the ball over, which again, not the biggest confidence play for Kyle McCord yeah. uh, when you're doing that. And he thought, like, hey, we're going to get the ball back to start the third quarter. It's going to be okay. So you have that moment. Then you also have... um going for it, passing up, you know, the field goal, you have that scenario. Like, they let Penn State hang around. It felt like Ohio State was kind of playing with their food the whole time, right? And Penn State had the opportunities, but just couldn't capitalize. But, yeah, for me, a few of those Ryan Day decisions, you think you're like, man, like, why why is he doing this? Um, but ultimately, like, it, it works out. That crowd at the end of the game then starts mocking Penn State with some, some flavorful language. Uh, yeah. And we saw that. I mean, even pre Some weird right? like, field storming, too. Like, I don't like this happened yeah. two years ago, too. Like, there was a full field storming two years ago. Some fans like stormed the field. Like, what are you doing? Like, what's, there were a handful by five of five and a half points. I don't know. That yeah, happened. that was weird. There were like a handful of Ohio State fans that made it onto the yeah. field afterward and like security is quickly getting them off. Yes. Um, bizarre. But, like, again, I mean, I think when you're trying to slot this loss in, um, in the James Franklin Ohio State losses, because we've got nine of them to rank now, it's like, to me, this is one of those ones that you say it has to hurt more for Penn State, for Penn State fans, because you had the chances, uh, but you just couldn't get it done. And I think that is that is what's going to, to haunt Penn State when they look back at this one. I think that's what's going to haunt this program when you look ahead a little bit, right? Like this isn't just one of those losses where you say, yeah, you played poorly. Like that happens. Forget about it. Like it was just so lopsided on one side of the ball. Um, after the game, I was on the field kind of following Olu Fashionu and then Manny Diaz was right there. So, so you're watching him and he just looked stunned. I mean, to me, it was like yeah. Manny just kind of kept making sure the defensive players got off the field that nothing Nothing happened because there's obviously some chippiness there, you know, an edge with, with both of these teams. Um, so, but yeah, just just looked absolutely stunned after this. So here's the thing. To end this on a bit of a positive note for Penn State fans, mm -hmm. this was bad. There's no way around it. If some way, somehow, Penn State beats Michigan, yep, we're right back to where we were a week ago. And this is a three-way tiebreaker. Three. You now need to root wanna... for Iowa. <laughs> Do you want to, well, if Iowa who lost today? Is, to, I was going to say, is, uh, is this supposed to be a positive, a positive yeah. spin? Well, no, he, no, here's the actual positive spin. It can always be worse because North Carolina, who's undefeated, just lost to Virginia 10 seconds ago. North Ooh. Carolina to a dreadful Virginia team. Florida State is currently down three to Duke. Duke is driving on Florida State in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. Like, now, by the time you listen to this, you know the result of that game. And if Florida State loses that game, suddenly 
three unbeaten teams have yeah. lost today, and those ranks of the unbeaten slowly dwindle. And and I don't, I'm not, I am not saying this, right? I do not do. And this is not my voice saying this. People will be able to say, "I want names, John. Continue. Who are the people? I need names." You no, know, this will be a narrative that you hear, right? Like if yeah. they, if teams continue to fall, and let's say Penn State, there's like two undefeated teams at the end of the regular season, Georgia and someone else. What happened? People will be able to say that Penn State has, or let's say it's Georgia and Ohio State, be able to say that Penn State has the best loss of any of those teams. You think? You think Ohio That's State? That conversation. So I've never been as big of a believer in JJ McCarthy as others have. Um, now Michigan just absolutely steamrolling at Michigan State. That's in like Whew. the Disarray dismay right them, now. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really bad. But I I don't know. I do know that once again though they will have the best players, the best offensive players on the field. Like Marvin Harrison Jr. is better than Blake Corum. I think Kate Stover's yeah. other than Brock Bowers, the best tight end in the country. Bowers obviously not healthy at Georgia yeah. right now. Um, like, I don't know that Michigan has the offensive firepower to blow them out. And Ohio State's defense is good enough to – like, I, I don't know that yeah. Kyle McCourt's much worse than J.J. McCarthy. I'm sure there will be plenty of people that vehemently disagree with me, namely those who are Michigan fans. I understand. That's fair. I, I fully get that. Um, I don't believe McCarthy's that much better than McCord. And I do believe that McCord, as we saw today, has the best weapon, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. And he will have the best player on the field with him. So I fully – in rivalry game, it's the game, right? Like absolutely possible that Ohio State wins that. Um, or that, you know, and, and frankly, if Michigan wins it, then and Penn State beats Michigan. There's a whole other scenario there. Uh, but, like, it, there is a world still where Penn State makes the college football playoff. Today should not give you confidence that it can happen, right? That, that like, suddenly Penn State is going to magically get better offensively. But with changes, potentially drastic ones, uh, they can get better. So, like, the season is not over. Uh, and I don't – because I, you know what's going to happen, right? Everyone's downtrodden now. If they beat Michigan in three weeks, you'll be able to pull up this episode and be like, think about how downtrodden you were then and how elated you would be after a Michigan win. Right. Like, I don't think it's impossible for Penn State to be Michigan. I don't think it's going to happen. I will. I would be shocked if I don't pick Michigan to win that game, um, despite it being Beaver Stadium. They reserve the right to but get like, better, John. That's the thing, right? Like, Yes, right. Like, this is – we see it all the time in, in college sports, especially. These are kids at the end of the day in, in large part. And, you know, ability can improve. It can it can, it can can dissipate quickly based on, like, you know, how it, the flow of the game is going. So, I like, it's, it's fully possible for in two weeks, three weeks, suddenly – they're like one of a bundle of one loss teams and they have the best loss in the country because uh, because Ohio state's that good. Um, yeah. I'd, listen, they're not going to overlook Indiana. They're going to do the one and over with Indiana. They're going to do it with, with Maryland. They'll probably win both those games. And then it's still like, it's still all out there. I just don't think this is the outcome to give you confidence, but it still exists. Like all of it still exists. All of it is still in front of Penn State as much as it may not feel like it is, uh, as much as it may have not have sounded like it is based on listening to us talk for the last hour. I was going to say, yeah, this um, is a very uh, I, I depressing think, episode. Yeah, but I don't like that. It's it's the heat of the moment, right? It's what it feels mm -hmm. like right now. It's what we just watched. But at the end of the day, it's all there if they can fix it. They have to fix it. That's a massive and thing. Fix it fast, absolutely, but... Right, and fix it fast. They've got two games to workshop whatever they need to workshop and be in that position by the time they face Michigan. Um, but it's fixable, and it's there. And like I said, North Carolina losing to Virginia, not on my bingo card for today. Not a thing that I would have thought was feasible. Uh, and again, by the way, Duke continues to drive – or yeah, Duke continues to drive down the field on Florida State. Like, college football's weird. Washington plays Arizona State later tonight. I'm sure – you know, that, that has a chance to get frisky. Like, it's just – it's a weird sport. Things can happen. The season is not over. But I think, you know, Penn State is in need of some drastic changes uh, before they, they try and move forward. Um, but, yeah, I think I think that is as good of a place as any to leave it. I apologize. <laughs> this, Whew, this where, was, yeah, this hopefully is this was, yeah, Hopefully this was therapeutic, therapeutic for Penn State fans. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and have that uh, – you know, have this to listen to and, and to watch and kind of work through it and – you know, to that, that light at the end of the tunnel, try to give you that too, while understanding that it is it may and be in dire right now. By the time you're listening to this on Sunday, it means that the sun has come up. That's and that right. It's another day, right? So, so there's I don't that. Know if it, it may be gloomy tomorrow. I'm not entirely That's sure. Yeah, we haven't really seen the sun much. Really visible. Yeah, um, it's been but, very gloomy. 
as always, uh, please rate, review, subscribe, the Nittany Dispatch, yes. wherever you get your podcasts. John and I will be back uh, midweek, and it's going to be a busy week again. because We'll have some be answers, hopefully. Hopefully we come bearing answers. If not, I'm sure we'll have plenty more questions. Because that's yes, just we, kind of we we will just continue asking kind of our how, questions to you. How this goes. Yeah, we will pose our questions to you. Um, but thank you for listening to us. Uh, if you enjoy it, we hope you do. Um, we'll be back all season, but tell a Penn State friend, fan. Um, this is the Nitty Dispatch with Audrey Snyder and John Sauber, and we'll see you midweek.